Okay, so I think we're, uh, we're live with the recording now, so we had a little bit of a glitch. Um, thank you all for coming. I really didn't know if anybody would show up, uh, being a bunch of uh, technical, brilliant, you know, mathematical folks coming to a warm and fuzzy cultural kind of uh, discussion. But what, <laughs> so, hey, um, it, you'd be surprised. I actually have a story about um, one culture where the warm and fuzzy process discussions really weren't warranted, and the manager only gave me 15 minutes with his team a week. So how are you supposed to kind of get any change accomplished in that kind of time? So that was a, that was a hard knock. Um, but anyway, welcome to Culture Eats Agile Practices for Breakfast. Um, it's a, a quote stolen from Peter Drucker, who I completely idolize, and uh, he told us a long time ago that any kind of change transformation, the existing culture will just gobble it up. And not one person, not the CEO, not a very uh, strong vocal leader within teams can actually change the culture. The culture is a very complex dynamic system and it's made up of a bunch of or countless moving parts and pieces. So we're gonna talk a bit about that and then I, I have a framework for what I need to tell you and then I have a bunch of stories and things that I'd like to pepper in and some tips and tricks just from uh, almost a decade of consulting and you know, succeeding with some and failing miserably with others. And uh, hopefully that is, that's helpful to you. So um, without further ado, a little bit about me. Um, um, those, are, those are my dogs. Uh, that's where I spend the rest of my time when I'm not talking about Agile. Um, I got started with Scrum when I worked for Primavera Systems out in Bala Kenwood um, about nine years ago now, actually, as of March. And uh, we were really struggling with delivering product that our customers wanted. We were delivering and we were making dates okay, negligible if you, or interesting if you think about what's really done um, and the quality level that was being delivered. And so we decided to use Scrum as a way to um, uh, change the way we were doing things. So we brought in Ken Schwaber, he locked us in a room for two days and taught us how to do more uh, vertical slice uh, user story planning instead of you know, uh, horizontal component based um, requirements planning. And that took us a couple of days to figure out. We uh, got started and we never looked back. A um, year and a half later, I started my company called Agile Evolution and really just fell in love with this way of working, having been a process nerd ever since I can remember, literally the age of four or five. Um, this really appealed to me after I got over my own personal change curve in the beginning. So I wasn't a big fan of Scrum when I first started. So project manager type, you know, really kind of violated all of the things that I thought um, were intuitive and made sense from an efficiency perspective and all those kinds of things. So I latched onto it, started Agile Evolution, and haven't looked back. I'm not down the road teaching the waterfall class uh, next week. This is what I uh, live, eat, and breathe. I've been to 17 countries, hundred, worked with hundreds of teams in any you know, Fortune 50s down to the, the startups, uh, to government entities out in DC and Virginia, which ugh, talk about lean and value add, that just really gets my blood going. Um, I had to kind of quit going there for a while. So um, I did manage to co-author a book somehow with Michelle Sliger. I don't know how we got that out, but um, it is the software managers or software project managers bridge to agility. There you go, I forgot the title. Um, it's Pearson, and it actually was to help traditional managers like myself cross the bridge into agility and, and different ways of working, which I think are really important. Um, I am genuinely interested in making work a great place for knowledge workers. That's what we do. We can't put it on an assembly line. We can't quantify every moving part and piece. We deal with very complex, robust systems, and I think that we need to have some fun doing it and work in ways that make sense for us. We're not uh, the production line that we can be uh, scientifically managed, if you will. All right. So I, I, I very, um, very much rant on this in my classes and in my coaching. Um, I'm really fed up with fragile agile really fed up with it. Um, here we are uh, 10, 11 years after the, after the Agile Manifesto was written, and you're still seeing partially implemented Scrum Butt, Fragile Agile, Scrum or Fall, Water Scrum, whatever you want to call it, because we're having trouble changing the way we do business. Right? I see something more closely related to Agile um, in Scandinavia, interestingly enough, and um, in startups. Everybody's in it together anyway, so it's an interesting thing. Um, every training class that I do, I start off with a quick exercise because I want to hear from people in the class, and this is something you can take back with you as well if you're looking at kicking off, and I don't want to call it an agile transformation, I want to call it a change management initiative that will help your company or your development team become more agile. 
okay? Agile, being able to deliver the right things fast and being flexible in our response. And there are a few things that we need to do to make that happen. So anyway, this is an exercise that I will ask the, my teams or managers, or executives who I'm talking to, to think about two parts. Why are you here? What do you need to change in your organization? And you'll get a litany of things. And I could pretty much carry that list with me from class to class. It's pretty much the same stuff. It's, um, it takes us so long to get tangible deliverables. And then when we deliver, it's not right. The customer wanted something different, or we missed the mark, or the quality level wasn't where we need it to be. And, and here's another. We want to be able to adapt to late requests. You know, our traditional way, we get so locked into requirements that, you know, we, we avoid change at all costs as we get close to, you know, throwing it over the wall to testing those kinds of things, or forget it, absolutely no changes when the QA group has it. Um, we want to be able to make trade-offs. We want to have two-way planning so that we're looking at not only at a development level what's happening tactically day-to-day, -day, but what's happening at the, the level above, what's happening strategically, um, what does our product owner want, those kinds of things. So more whole team involvement. And of course, everybody wants team empowerment. That's a pretty cool concept. And a better quality of life. Those two really go hand in hand. We have more power than what we think we do. Um, the second question is what blocks? And I was in one class uh, not too long ago, maybe about a year, and I was asking people, okay, what blocks you? And thinking about where your current state is and what your desired state is. And I got all kinds of answers. Again, pretty good representation of what those answers usually are. But there's confusion. Um, we've got to crawl out of our past architectural decisions. It's a very um, deep architecture and, and legacy code base. There's a lot of pressure. There's the engineering mindset, and there was an add to this, the QA mindset, and they don't always uh, jive. Okay, they're on two sides of the fence. And, and our executives run our performance reviews where they really do pit us against the other, one against the other. And one woman was just sitting in, in, the, in the training class and she's starting to turn red and she's getting very upset. And I get that every now and then and, you know, used to a lot eight years ago, not so much now. But I mean, if she had a tomato, she was going to chunk it at me and her, her face looked like a tomato actually, but she was getting really upset really mad. I could tell that what I was saying, and maybe it was my delivery, was really upsetting her. But um, after about five more minutes of this discussion with what blocks, um, Sally stormed out. She could not bear to face the truth. She couldn't get out of the fact that to get from point A to point B, certain things were going to have to change, and she couldn't envision herself working in that way. It just seemed overwhelming. And so I, you know, thought about that experience, and of course I tried to talk her into staying. I tried to, you know, work with her through that, but she was gone. Um, we'll come back to Sally at the end of the uh, the end of the discussion, right? What causes our discomfort with change? What makes it so difficult? I mean, we're all familiar with the concept of homeostasis or homeostasis, where organisms like to be in a state of uh, equilibrium at all times, and and we drive everything biologically, mechanically, or however through that. And from a psychological perspective, we're doing the same thing. We like to be in a routine. I had to travel a lot for work um, back in 08, 09, and, and it was really uncomfortable getting in a different rhythm, you know, eating food out, not being able to exercise. I'd come home for a month, have some office hours, get into that routine again, which was wonderful, and then off I went. And so it was really tough to, meet, to reach any sort of equilibrium. And it was difficult, you know, the two days before having to fly out again, Ugh, oh, I've got to fly and I've got to do all this, you know, go through security and, and pack all my stuff and put my shampoo in these little tiny bottles and you know, stuff that's a pain in the neck. So we're, just, we're not comfortable with change. And this comes um, predominantly from our culture, um, basically being defined as a, sh a set of shared attitudes, values, belief that, that groups of people have in common, whether it's our religious beliefs, whether it's um, you know, driving out to, to Lancaster a few miles west and seeing the buggies and the horses and really being in awe of a, such a different lifestyle. Um, maybe it's the, the company that we associate ourselves with. Maybe we have a, a deep cultural um, engagement there. Perhaps it is our age group. And culture, yeah, there's not usually a culture club, although um, many executives like to think that they control the, the culture, much like, you know, you're all marionettes on strings. And that's interesting. I think leaders can set a good vision, but that's not everything. Empowerment doesn't come from the top. So let's, let's talk about that. Um, seven components of culture. Social organization, customs and tradition, language, 
arts and literature, religion, government, economic systems. Um, I've done a lot of training out in Sweden, and it is very different from training here in the US. I go to Sweden, and everybody's just happy. They are really excited to be there. Um, they're in it, they're participating. I've seen the best paper prototypes come out of a two-day class than anywhere else in Sweden. Um, it's not surprising, really, if you look at the seven components of culture. The agile way of working, which is very team-based, a very flat way of organizing uh, knowledge workers, if you will, not resources, we're humans, we're not resources, okay, um, is, is a way that very much jives with their social organization, their government, their economic structure. It makes sense. It's not violating too much, okay? They really want to know, how do I do it? Okay, show me, teach me the rules, teach me the rituals and the customs. So I, I fly from Sweden and I go to like, um, uh, big business out in Detroit, you know, and everything's layered and, you know, you've got a five to one manager employee ratio and, huh, yeah, I've seen it. Um, and so you start talking about, you know, flat teams and, and having teams be empowered and working in priority order when all they're dealing with is chaos and blah, blah, blah. And people get really upset. This is a very, it's all about me in the U.S. What are you talking about? I've got to get that promotion. My career path is based on me becoming a lead, then a manager, then a director, et cetera. And if I don't get that, that's my dangling carrot, I don't really want to perform. I'm going to move on to the next thing. Okay, so it's interesting when we start considering performance rewards, um, performance and reward systems, and the way that we can align that with the type of cultural change we're trying um, to seek. Um, I'm a Texas girl. I grew up uh, in Port Arthur, Texas. A, anybody familiar with Port Arthur? Oh, one person, okay. Um, I grew up in actually a suburb of Port Arthur is that, that actually could be broken down any smaller. Um, the very poor, rural, um, Gulf Coast oil town with a lot of cows and a lot of rice fields. Education was not emphasized. It's kind of like you just work hard and you'll make it happen, which there is definitely that component as well. But you know, you don't need to go to college. And those, those kinds of, those kind of cultural attitudes towards, or at least that was my family, which family is a social organization structure and culture too. Um, so I moved to New Jersey a few years ago, and boy, you talk about culture shock, okay? First of all, everybody spoke way too fast for me, you know, and I'm still saying yes, sir, and no, ma'am, and thank you, and please, and I was looked at like I had three heads, okay? So I learned very, very quickly by the looks I got to, all right, cut the, cut the fat, you know, just get to the point and move on, get out of the line, right? Um, I didn't know what a bagel was until I moved to New Jersey, and I had never had Chinese food until I moved to New Jersey. Crazy, big culture shock. Um, I've learned to become very adaptable as I go in from one organization to the next because it's different everywhere. Some places are just so happy to see me. Please help me get off of five different projects simultaneously. It's killing me, it is physically killing me. Or, you know, hey, we're so happy to learn about, you know, agile because we're stuck in, you know, analysis paralysis and we can't get anything out the door. And so that's exciting. I also get into some situations where you're a girl and you're wearing lipstick and uh, you're not quite a developer, so mm, we're not gonna listen to you. <laughs> 15 minutes with a team a week, that's all you get. Okay, so kind of stepped into it all. And it's, it's coming from this. It's, it's basically people saying, I might have to learn something, whether I apply it or not is up to me. Maybe management's making me do this, but I have to think about changing. And humans, by nature, are not comfortable with changing, especially when you're inspecting and adapting every two weeks, perhaps, or even better, every week, or even better, no iteration. You're just getting stuff out the door as soon as you can, if that works for your customers. Um, so we, you know, we start thinking about inspecting and adapting on very, very short cycles. That means we're constantly changing. We're constantly looking for things that we can do better. And some folks have a trouble with that because they may have built the institution that exists. And so now everything becomes transparent. Okay. So why is culture so important? We have a need to belong. And we have an evolutionary need which helps us survive. People, you know, travel the world in packs, I guess, call them a pack, um, thinking of my dogs. Um, and they help each other stay alive. We all have the need to belong, whether it's to a social organization, we like being a part of a team, 
Some people don't. Maybe we just like the company that we work for. We really hold close its values. Whatever it is, we have to belong to a circle of folks. Um, there was a, a famous research paper written back in the 90s about a um, overcrowded orphanages um, who didn't have enough caretakers to go around to all of the children. And you know the children were routinely fed and, and fed well, but they weren't given much attention, if at all. And the children in these, these overcrowded situations um, developed to really have mental distress and in some cases disorders, right? They weren't, they weren't interacted with socially, they, they weren't uh, treated as human. And so we, they're one of many studies like that, I think the other famous one is with the, the Regis monkeys, but, um, but we're, we're conditioned, we are born needing to belong. Um, look up belongingness on Wikipedia, it actually is a word, I was surprised. Okay. Um, so agile is a set of practices and values. One without the other is fragile. It's not agile, okay? And the way we get it done is gonna be different depending on the organization that we're in, depending on what our customers need and how fast we can move. So it's interesting to hear, uh, gosh, I heard the word iteration manager last week and I just cringed. I said, oh, this is the person who manages the burn down chart or manages the task board. Okay, the, um, so just implement iterations with iteration managers, wahoo. Um, or just certify scrum masters. Everybody goes to scrum training and gets certified and that'll make us better, right? No, um, the, the scale is tilted in the direction of practices and everybody forgets probably conveniently the values piece because that's the hard stuff. And the way that values are represented, um, or coming up in just a second, that reinforce the old way of working. They're not aligned with the new change that we're, we're seeking. So to be agile is to embrace both values and practices. Without values, practices are meaningless. And without rituals or traditions, it's difficult to reinforce values. So they play off of each other, and there's a reason. And I think that reason gets lost. I'm fed up with fragile, so I'm just gonna make the big tour uh, circuit this year and just gripe and complain and try to get the word out there. 10, 11 years later and longer, if folks have been uh, practicing agile ideas, we're still seeing a mess, okay? So when the values don't match up with the practices or vice versa, we have a state of culture confusion, okay? I don't know what to do. You're telling me, Agile says to you know, plan, do, check, act, and inspect and adapt, and our team is, is retrospecting, and we're bringing all these ideas to management, and then nothing happens. Nothing changes as a result. It's like it just goes out into the abyss, and we never hear from anybody. So it's culture confusion implementing these practices without or supporting values. Hence, Agile gets watered down. It's all the, all the buzzwords. I saw a few people kind of laughing uh, when I said fragile, water scrum, scrum or fall, scrum butt, one or two T's depending on who you're talking to, Franken scrum or agile like. This is why we hear this because when you think about it, the process itself is pure. It's plan, do, check, act. Ain't rocket science, although some of us in here may be doing that. It layers onto anything, but why do we change? Why do we not implement or just start off with its purest form, culture? We're afraid of visibility, we're afraid of transparency into our existing constructs because we might have to tear them down and do something differently. Uh, this was the big lesson to uh, um, the Numi plant out in uh, California, I think the late 70s, they were making the Chevy Vega and the S10 pickup, and half the people were coming to work drunk every day, they were you know, union workers, didn't really care about what they were doing. Um, one guy was quoted as, you know, I saw an S10 pickup in the parking lot over at Great Adventure, or wherever, whatever they have out there in California, and he says, I felt sorry for the poor guy who bought that truck. Because the idea was inspect quality in at the end of the line, okay? Develop and then test, sound familiar? So you would get an entire warehouse full of defective automobiles that someone from QA, Quality Assurance, would come along and tick off the boxes in their checklist and then maybe they'd get fixed, maybe not, but you'd have a bunch of um, faulty inventory. That's bad, it's really not good. So we wanna think about our software the same way in building quality in, not inspecting it in. This is a game changer. What do you mean? I'm a developer, I have to test now? Oh, you mean I have to write those unit test thingies? Oh, ooh, yeah, okay. Um, well, we don't have enough testers on our team because they're still working on the other project. 
And, and we don't have the skill sets to, to write test automation. I bet you do. You just need to figure it out, okay? So it's, and then the QA people say, we really need that spec so that we know what we're testing for because we don't get it until, you know, one big monolithic chunk. So it's, um, Agile comes along and people are afraid of envisioning themselves working in this new way with a new set of values and rituals. It's completely foreign. Um, so what do we do? We make excuses so that we have to change that much. Ah, uh, we'll just implement this piece or that piece. Um, like the Hippocratic Oath, um, written by Hippocrates in the fifth century, uh, um, talking about the promises that doctors needed to make to patients and to uh, ethically in their, in their field of practice. And um, it was interesting when I did a little research on this, how much that statement has changed over the centuries. The original version was uh, giving thanks to Apollo and all of the other gods and preventing practices like euthanasia and abortion. And slowly through time, especially in the late 1800s, the Hippocratic Oath started to change because it was not politically correct, didn't fit with various religions, in fact, flew in the face of it in some cases. And so we started to um, uh, make it generic, make it PC. And it's interesting, almost 100% of the medical schools in the US have doctors recite the Hippocratic Oath, but a poll showed that maybe 20% didn't agree with it. They didn't buy into the value system. I mean, the example is, uh, I guess, Dr. Kevorkian, and or um, I guess you can go to Switzerland and you know write your own ticket if you like. Okay, so that's a that's a flying in the face of values, but yet they're saying it anyway. That's what we uh, we typically do, or we've done with Agile as an industry. We're still not there yet. A lot of us are pretty far down the path. So how do we instill values? Um, Scrum says the Scrum master is responsible. Oh, you're the change agent now after a two-day class. Good luck with that. <laughs> XP says the team owns it. Love the idea, good luck with that, All right? Some teams readily grab onto it, and if they have executive or management support, they fly. They become really high performing. It's the best possible scenario, not only for the team, but the coach. I love being in a situation like that. But it's not, I would say out of 20 teams, maybe three or four have that luxury of really being empowered. Um, people don't often seize power even when it's dangled in front of them. At Primavera, we were, scale we were probably one of the first um, uh, scaled scrum guinea pigs uh, back in 2003. I was number 32 scrum master, so that'll tell you. I think our, our set of people was the first class, so maybe the second class. But, um, so uh, we had to figure out this empowerment thing, and people got really upset about this. We're sitting in, in a, a sprint planning meeting and two, three sprints in, and a couple of the, of the developers and uh, testers just really, again, got angry, started getting the tomato face, you know, just not very happy. And, and, and they said, well, if we're managing all this, if we have to do our, manage our own tasks and our own backlogs and the way that we talk to each other every day, what are you doing? I was the project manager. And I said, huh, that's a very good question. I should probably go find something to do because I'm not task you know, mastering anymore. I'm not running a Gantt chart. I'm not putting everything into Primavera P3 and you know, resource leveling. Um, team's managing itself. Lucky for, for us, we had a, a VP um, in development who really got it and paved the way for us. He said, you guys are empowered. You're going to do this. All of you own quality. It just doesn't rely with one group and we're gonna make this happen. So we had support from the top and we made it happen. He gave us an environment where it was not um, a bad thing if you failed. He said, please experiment, figure it out, innovate product and process. Let's make this as lean as we can. I learned so many good things from Bob Schatz. Um, some of you may know him, he's, he's local out in Bucks County, just a really great guy. He really got it and he put his neck on the line because if it didn't work, guess who's you know, getting the next package? Bob, but it worked, and it worked beautifully. We had a lot of things to figure out. Our code base was a mess. We went through a year and a half refactoring initiative alongside of building features in. We couldn't even write test, automated tests. It was so bad. So we started iteratively going through that process. We got Uncle Bob to come out and talk to us. We really started focusing as a management team on what we could do differently. We not only thought about it as a management team, but also engaged the teams to help us 
so the teams came up with some really cool concepts, especially with sustaining or supporting existing um, versions that we could have never dreamt up as a management team. And so we really learned to listen and to, to make the way we ran our development a collaborative effort. Um, many, uh, I see many things that are holding teams back, and these are kind of the top, I guess the top four perhaps, um, performance reviews. You know, folks are, are motivated by many things. I think for a lot of us in this room, it's, it's motivation by working with interesting people or cool technologies or discovering the latest and greatest or just having a real tough problem to solve. That's kind of a thing we like to do. And you know, money's important for many of us. Um, uh, and uh, gosh, was it one company I said, how many, how many of you are motivated by money? And they all raised their hands. For some raised two hands. And I said, okay, um, put your hands down. How many of you are motiva motivated by anything else? You could have heard a pin drop. Nothing else. We want the bonus. That's why we're here. We're going to work overtime. We're going to kill ourselves. The quality of their product was horrible. Absolutely horrible. But they're going to get the bonus, cut, and run. It's someone else's problem at that point. Okay. So performance reviews, you have to reward team behavior in addition to individual behavior. So make a team component. It's really simple. You're, you're reviewed, your people are reviewed on how well they meet strategic objectives, how well they meet group objectives, um, product objectives, team objectives, and then self. And then some folks will argue, and the longer I do this, the more I'm starting to believe that performance reviews are, I think we could probably do without them. Okay, there may be other ways. What's that? Yeah, you don't need them. So it's, um, we know the performance based on the results. Okay, and I may have a team, and I've had a team actually, that we called them the frat. They sat in a back room and it looked like they were doing nothing. They were doing some stuff. Um, they were doing some really cool stuff actually. Um, first, um, first mobile ads a few years back, and we can all thank them. Okay, <laughs> um, so so they sat back in the room. They had incense burning. They had other stuff burning probably. Um, they had the the beads when you walk through the door. And I'm kidding. Um, and so you know, just a really kind of loose bunch. Um, but they did some cool stuff. And if we were to manage them by our traditional metrics, lines of code, ah, um, whatever we're doing, um, how many features we can do, how many points we can burn up or down or sideways, um, you know, we could manage the hell out of them and make them look efficient and make them go to work. But that team delivered by far more value than the 10 teams who were you know, really increasing their velocity every sprint, doing all the right things and making us feel good because we had some great results on paper. Okay, so it's all about the value delivery. It's all about meeting the needs of the customer. If we're doing that, I'd say that's our performance review. Okay. Um, manager's outlook or management style, this is a killer. It's gonna be a killer or an enabler, a wonderful enabler. Um, an openness to change. Um, I, I work with a very large um, network slash telecom slash 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 out in Silicon Valley and um, we were scaling a program of 37 teams, uh, 37 teams that touched cell phones and video conferencing and um, other devices and very much siloed knowledge, um, lots of handoffs, just a, a bear of a program to, to get through. It was, you know, Agile made things very visible but was also very, very hard, lots of coordination. Um, and it was interesting because we would have all of the teams, all 37 of them, who were distributed, um, really bad uh, examples of that sometimes, um, we'd have them all meet in release planning. And release planning would take about a week for all the teams to finally get their information back into, uh, we're using a large enterprise project management tool, who shall remain nameless. No, it was actually really good, it helped us tremendously. Um, but the point of my long-winded story is that management said, okay, we have these 2,000 things to get through, and we have 40 teams, so that's 500 per team over five sprints, so 100 or 10, whatever it was, my math's bad. I'm so nervous to be here today for some reason. Um, so 10 items per team per sprint for the next five sprints. That should do it. So what does the team do? They say, okay. We'll do it. Even if our, our best collective estimates tell us it's going to take us 10 sprints, we're going to shove it into five. Because management would put this all on a big plan and say, it's our agile commit. 
agile target is probably a nicer way of putting that, but breaking a very large 18-month program down into small quarterly cycles and calling those agile commits. So what happened as a result? The teams worked overtime. They started, you know, started out okay, um, delivering some features, demoing. Um, the demo was a complete, the first executive demo was a complete hack, as we soon grew to know. Grown to, grown to know, and um, the teams were really just just pushing out poor quality, but a lot of features, but really bad quality. Okay, um, the managers had so much power, even implicitly, that people were afraid to say no. You know, we can do ten features, do it right, or we can do twenty and you know half. You know, you know what it. Okay. Um, an organizational culture that fears experimentation, this is another a biggie, and the group think that, oh, we're fine, everything's okay, we're the smartest, we work for the best company, we have a gazillion dollars in the bank, you can't teach us anything, and we don't need to change. Okay, that's what the American automobile makers said a few decades ago, too. Okay, so empowerment. Um, it's not a gift bestowed on us by others. It is a decision that lies within our own power to make. So what does this mean? We're trying to create self-organizing, some people say self-managing teams. I fully believe it, knowledge work. Um, we need a vision, we need a, a, thing, a, a list of things to work on, but the way that the solution is innovated and the way that that work is managed should be up to the teams. And we should be able to, by delivering high quality product increments or features, be able to turn flexibly and, and quickly whenever a new thing is needed. That's the whole idea. All right, so um, let's talk about a couple of examples, and I'm going to have you guys uh, have a couple of discussions, and we'll see where you end up with this, all right, because I'm tired of me talking. I'm fed up with me talking. Um, let's talk about the daily stand-up meeting. And I thought about the title of, this, of the uh, session, um, Culture Eats Agile Practices for Breakfast, and I, then I thought about bacon and eggs, and then I thought about chicken and pigs. I'm like, this is a great picture to put in this slide, okay? So um, the daily stand-up meeting is the most, in my opinion, mistranslated, abused meeting in Agile. This one really gets just beat up and battered, okay? 15 minutes, same day, I mean, sorry, same place, every day, same time. The team, were, you know, answers three questions. It's fine to deviate from that after a while, too. We're agile. <laughs> uh, it's not intended for managers. It's intended for the team to synchronize, okay? So what I would, I think I have an exercise, yes. Um, let's play the five whys. This is a tool that comes to us actually from Six Sigma, which depending on how you implement it, implement it may or may not be lean. Um, but it's an interesting way of finding the root cause of a particular situation. So the problem is that our team says, in retrospective, you don't need to meet in a stand-up every day. It's too much overhead. Okay. So what I'd like for you to do is just pair up with somebody or you know a couple of other people, and talk about why this is the case. And the game of five whys is to basically. Once you discover a reason, so we don't need to meet in a stand-up on a daily basis, there'll be a reason for that that the team feels is important, such as, well, we're all co-located anyway, so why do we need to meet because we're already in sync? Okay, the, the idea would be that you would ask why again, right? So, well, I think we've probably hit the critical, um, or the, the root cause with that one, um, but maybe, uh, <laughs> let's see, well, it's going over to 30 or 40 minutes per day. Well, why is that? Well, because our Scrum Master doesn't know what he or she is doing. Well, why is that? Oh, send him a training. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, well, you know, hey, all right, let's get to the why, and guess what? As a team, we can police that. This is our meeting anyway. Okay, so what I'd like for you to do is come up with just a, a you'll take some creative license with this. So come up with a dialogue, take the problem, and ask the five whys. See if you can get to five and see what root cause you can come up with. So, and I'll, I'll ask for a volunteer if, if that's okay. All right, so three to five minutes. Okay, so we've got a, a noisy bunch. I like this, okay? Um, you may or may not have gotten all the way back to your root cause, but I am curious to hear if anybody did. Did anybody come out with a surprise, or did the conversation take a direction that you didn't expect? And would you mind sharing that with us, if, if that's the case? 
So we don't need to meet in a stinking daily stand-up meeting. Yeah, please. So as a developer, uh, one of the myths that I see is we often think that our method of communication, whatever it is, is sufficient. So either a daily email or communicating with one person and expecting it to get around to the rest of the team, we think, I don't need a stand up. I've just told you everything that I need to tell you. Exactly. So we don't need to create any additional noise by, by holding another meeting. So did everybody hear that? Yeah. Our, our mode of communication is already sufficient. We can IM, party chat, send an email. That, that should work. Okay, good. Did you ask, um, did you get anywhere with the five whys on that? Because that's your belief. So why, why do you believe that? Okay. Okay, gotcha. All right. Was there another example? Yeah, do you have one? So uh, ours is because we have something better to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's, there's a limited amount of executive function available in each person, um, a limited number of changes you can do all at once and that sort of stuff. Um, rather than bringing in the stand-up and, and other sorts of rituals, uh, it's a lot more important to just focus on the technical practices. So it's all about changing the way people design their code such that it's testable and all that sort of stuff. Well, I get to communications and planning and that sort of stuff significantly down the road. First, we need to build a strong engine. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's a, a great um, reason. And I think what can benefit teams in that case is not the traditional daily scrum of what did you do since yesterday's meeting and all that stuff, but perhaps maybe is what did I learn since yesterday or the last two days that I need to share with everybody else because in that case we're figuring out and exploring as we go. So that could be your, your war room uh, discussion instead. Yeah. Well, for, for that stuff, the, uh, the scope of, of information exchange on that is 85,000 people. So we're not going oh, to do that yeah. stand-up. True. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. You need to break that down into, uh, into manageable parts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Good. Okay. There was another hand? Was it you? Yeah, yeah, okay. Actually, I was okay. just going to ask you. I was like, okay. so do you have a lot of That's another uh, cultural lesson too. It's just because we're learning agile ways of working, we may or may not choose to completely replace everything we're currently doing. And so documentation can still be in the right mediums, in the right frequency, in the right ways, can be very important for teams. And in my 37 team example, the lack of documentation killed us. I mean, trying to scale in you know, however many countries and, and, and poorly written code and lack of tests, I mean, it just, it just piled up. So, and that's a consequence of trying to, to move too fast and appear as if we're delivering more than, than what we really do. Um, so if waterfall suits needs, continue to use it. And that's, that's, that's the final answer, okay. Um, so a couple of root causes. I have an example that I ran, I've run across a few times. Um, so if I ask why of a team, this is the answer that I've, I've gotten quite a bit actually. Um, we individually aren't interested in what the other team members are doing. I don't really care what Bob is doing. I've got my own stuff and I better get it out on time, okay? Um, so for whatever reason, we individually aren't interested in what other team members are doing. When I ask the second why, it's because we're working on our own tasks. I have my tasks, you have your tasks, that's why we do planning, right? Okay, why? Why are you working on your own tasks? A bunch of grumbling, because now you've asked me two whys. What are you, a five-year-old? So the third why, well, we don't think that pairing can help us go faster in the long run. We don't think that actually synchronizing more often or working together more closely will help us. It seems inefficient, and I really don't want to pair with that guy. So, that's, all right. Um, why is that? Well, that's our belief. Okay, challenge the belief. Why do we believe that? That's the way we've always done it. Okay, that's the culture speaking. Well, that's the way we've always done it. That's interesting. 
um, well, maybe we could try a different way. When all else fails as a coach, it's could we please just try it for one iteration, we're not married to it for the whole project, just two weeks, and let's see how it goes. Okay, and maybe the end result is a daily stand-up didn't help, or every two days, or what, whatever the frequency was, but we tried to change and try to ensure that we were communicating and tried pairing perhaps or other ways, uh, te technical ways of seeing if we can go faster with better quality. Um, and we learned from that. So now we have some new information that may, you know, the problem may remain or we may have found a different solution that works for our team. I see this a lot. Um, and I also see the, uh, this come out of the fact that the PMO or the resource management office is still staffing resources to tasks um, as you know the the traditional leveling of res resource way so I'm on six different projects and 20% here 15% there 10% there and I just want to get in and get out because I have my stuff on this team to do and stuff on six other teams that I have to do all right so that's a this is a common situation when you're really looking at organizations in transition No, if, you know, the, my first really bad example, I just got to one why, okay? And it was a positive reason. Hey, the team's in a room together already. A daily 15-minute meeting's overhead. I meant specifically yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, That's the way we call it. Yeah, uh, I mean, many teams would stop here and say, okay, let's go to twice a week. We're not gonna try anything different. If you keep pushing, you likely will get different answers. This isn't always the case. Um, maybe it's the fact that we're distributed and the leader or the scrum master uh, keeps running the meeting for 45 minutes, all right? And that's, you know, we just want to get back to doing what we think is important. So we would ask why, right? Well, it could be because they're trying to hold the phone line open for problem resolution or problem solving at the end. Okay, why? Because that's the only time we have core hours. Okay, well then the question would be, well, how could we have a better use of that time people who aren't interested should leave after 15 minutes, right? So we really put ground rules around that scenario. That's just another of, of many scenarios. But this is, um, especially in larger companies who are moving from a very uh, plan-driven, predictive planning approach to agile, you see this quite a bit, all right? A couple of more examples. Um, I have to go to New York City quite a bit. I have a few, a few clients out there. And um, every time I'm in line for a taxi at Penn Station, which I, I don't even do anymore, this is a long time ago, subway girl, um, I'm a subway rat. Um, but you see these poor people standing in line waiting on a taxi, and you know that, that there's this huge demand and only a limited supply. A taxi, by law, can only carry four people unless you're a child under the age of seven, you can sit on someone's lap, okay? So I, I'm always thinking about agile, so I think of taxis like iterations. You can only fit so much in, all right? So we asked, we have the five whys here, um, and this was another exercise I had for you guys, but we're, we're getting close on time, but we'll just walk through it as a, as a group. Um, as a Scrum Master, you discover that the team is really only capable of delivering 20 points of features in a sprint if they pay attention to things like refactoring, fixing defects, putting the right frameworks in place, et cetera. The problem is that the product owner is asking for the team to deliver 30 points per sprint and work overtime if it's necessary, um, especially if they want to do you know, the not so valuable stuff like refactoring and fixing defects. Um, and there's a big bonus when we release six months from now. So what do you do in this situation? What's the root cause? What's the problem? What's the real problem? The incentives may not be aligned. For some people, oh, big bonus, great, tell me how much. I'm gonna cut and run, I'll leave someone else with the problem, okay? Or I need to you know, get braces for my kid's teeth, that's important to me, okay? Six months, what's the problem with six months? Yeah. Oh, too short. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we're not giving the team maybe long enough to gel. So six months just might be a stretch for that reason. And six months of hacking is going to create longer term problems and longer, probably more expensive costs down the line. Okay. There could be important business reasons behind this scenario, but yes. Okay, great. Do they have a backlog big enough at this point? 
probably, the, the product owner is asking them to cram in 30 points of work into six sprints when only about 20 points can be done and done well. There's probably, yeah, there's always more demand than supply if we're doing business right. So, yeah, big backlog, got to get it out, need everything. Okay. I mean, really all we can, we may have been asked to do this in our professional careers. Um, when a developer or a development team member is asked to do more and to move faster, we always cut quality. Not only quality of products, but quality of life. Okay, this will cause issues down the road. It will eventually, um, if, if left to go on long enough, um, prevent us from being agile. If we're not delivering uh, running tested features, code that's been run through its paces, well structured, extendable every iteration, it gets really tough to get something out the door when needed. Product owner says, that's enough, ship it. We've been showing all this hacked functionality at demos, and he says, all right, get it out the door. And all of a sudden, we're going, uh, hmm, well, we need to go back and clean up this bug backlog we've been keeping on the side. Bug backlog? What do you mean a bug backlog? So the, the product owner has the, the decision to make. Perhaps it's a, a greenfield product, you know, new to market, and we really need to work hard, get the first iteration out, get the first version out, and start getting some ROI but you will have to pay the piper at some point, okay? It's ultimately up to, Scrum would say, the product owner. In a startup scenario, this would be the CEO. It's the, it's the company's asset. It's not a development team's asset to make decisions about. It is a business asset. That's a whole nother, like, two-day class, so. Um, iterations are not clown cars, okay? We can't keep just stuffing in more clowns because, you know, it'll be fun, and. That's the way we should work. If we keep saying yes, what's the quality of the ride? Okay, so we have to really think about that. This is one area that teams have so much power and so much leverage to say, okay, for us to do this and do this well, this would be the amount of work we can do. Okay, there's all this other tax that we have to pay when we do iterative incremental delivery. And we have to start educating the business about that. And it's going to be a negotiation. It's going to be a downright fight sometimes. But it's an education that needs to happen, just as the development team's learning from the business all about the what and the why. Okay, the two sides have to come together. There's the demand and the supply. You can't just keep adding because that's what it says on paper. It doesn't um, maybe not make sense. One final scenario. Um, we can't create dedicated teams. Again, the culture speaking. It's the way we've always done it. We, we um, allocate resource to task or expert to task. And there will be situations where that is the thing to do. And we might want to think about our truck number. The truck number coined by, and I'm, my brain is slipping, but how many of your experts, if they were hit by a truck, who would be on that list and, and would the company come to a screeching halt? That's the business risk of having too many experts. The value risk is that, um, well, this is also a business risk, that we are creating bottlenecks where it's very tough to get product out the door in an efficient way. It's a result of sub-optimizing. So we want to look at the, the big picture. How do we get humans on a team allowed to focus? We lose a lot of time to context switching, right? Three projects, a person spending 20% of their time on each project with 40% time lost to context switching. Okay. Everybody shakes their heads, says, yeah, oh, we know, oh, it's horrible, we hate it, and then they keep doing it. Okay. Now, again, um, there are situations where, you know, we do have true experts. Start pairing them with somebody. That may not be a, 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 a popular thing to think about. Or I guess we should ask that person if they'd like to pair, right? We're, we're trying to create self, you know, empower teams. But, but we want to think about how do we start to build knowledge across the whole system, OK? And it's important for a number of reasons. Which has the higher ROI? Keeping the expert on the task, running it through a Gantt chart. Tasks are never finished on time. They're either finished early or mostly late. Dependencies are never met on time. Um, we run into a whole litany of issues like that, but, but we are uh, uh, optimized for the short term because that person is the best person at doing that task and they're going to get it done the fastest. Okay? Or would this have a better return on investment? 
may take a while to get to it. We leave people on a team dedicated to the effort long term. They start building up knowledge about product and the way that product's been built with a shared ownership. Over time, this approach is going to have the higher return on investment. We've now created knowledge in our organization, may not be as quantifiable as putting the expert on the task, okay? But we will be able to break through some of the bottlenecks through time, not all of them, perhaps. We try to pair up people, get them to learn from each other. That's a, a lean concept, has um, been around for ages. Um, build knowledge, create knowledge in the system. All right, I just heard from a, a project manager that I work with out at Martha Stewart Living, and they just moved to dedicated teams a couple of months ago. Um, this was one of the situations where one of the developers pulled me to the side and he said, I'm working on five things. It's chaotic. Everybody's changing requirements as we come in. We're doing this brand and this thing and this for TV. And, and I can't get anything done. If there's one thing that will help me out of this process, it would be the ability to focus. They actually moved to dedicated teams. I couldn't believe it. You know, I ask for this all the time or I suggest it or I give case studies and numbers and all these kinds of things to back it up and maybe one out of 20 actually do it and they did it. So I was really excited. I got this email today actually and he says, our dedicated team approach is working wonders. He went on to say they're hitting some snags in the architecture. It's tricky, it's new, but it's working really well. They can focus the team's building knowledge and they're retaining that knowledge as they go versus the ex, you know, one person comes in and then out of the team. Another person comes in and then out of the team. It's very hard to work that way, very hard to focus. Okay, so what we can do uh, to influence culture for agility, there are a number of things, and I could go on about this, but from a leadership perspective, we have to know that one person can't change the culture. They can set the bar for the culture. I guess Steve Jobs is probably one of the most um, prevailing examples of that. But the first thing we need to do is create environments where it is safe to experiment and learn, or otherwise known as failing. Okay, failing is learning, and that's a very, very important idea in the kind of work that we do. Experiment, inspect and adapt. Create environments where all employees see themselves as innovators and entrepreneurs. There was a, a, a term that was coined back in the 70s called intrapreneurial teams. So you're allowed to self-manage and do whatever you need to do in order to meet the goal, but of course you're working on the company's backlog. I found that to be a very interesting concept. Create feedback loops and hold regular culture checks. Practice open communication. The grapevine, the gossip, the rumors will cause big problems. Oh, they're really just getting us to do agile because they all want to, you know, pull the parachute in a couple of years and off they go. They want us to do more for less. Oh, they really just want to micromanage us in the daily scrum meeting. Okay, that will really hurt. So leadership needs to encourage open communication and listen to the dang retrospective results. Start looking at the system as a whole, figure out which things can happen or, or change at a higher level to make it easier and more efficient and hopefully more productive for people to do their work. You'd be surprised at what, you guys probably aren't, but teams come up with some wonderful ideas. They're the ones doing the work every day. Um, couple, two more slides and then we're, I think we're done because our time box is out. Um, I, I see moving to a more agile way of working, um, like walking up a hill. Um, depending on your uh, cardiovascular strength, it could be easy or, or hard. Um, and when we get just a little bit up the hill, we can't see very much. We can't really see how far we've gone. We don't have a really good view of the horizon. But when we keep going up the hill, and it might, might start breathing a little heavier, it might be a little more taxing, now we've got this view that's amazing. We've come a long way. We can see what's behind us. We can see how far we've come, and now we've got a decision point to make. Now we've got a basis for comparison. So um, my advice to those of you who are struggling with some of these concepts, whether it's cultural or in practice, that's why we're here, we're here to learn, and not just process, but technology, um, let yourself struggle up the hill a few times, and then look back. Don't let culture uh, put a nail in the coffin from day one. Okay, so try. So what happened to Sally anyway? <laughs> She and about three others completely sabotaged the entire change initiative. I heard from this group two months ago, and I was actually doing some mentorship along the way, which is very uh, uh, frustrating. They decided they were going back to the old way. There were clear reasons for moving 
to a more flexible way of working in the first place. Remember that, that sheet that I put up in the second slide or third slide? That was all of their reasons. Satisfy the customer, deliver faster, have better quality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Three people through the rumor mill, through the gossip, through the um, being loud, knowing where the survey results went, et cetera, et cetera, caused the whole thing to crumble. They've gone back to the way they were doing things. Okay, so culture uh, will eat agile practices for breakfast and lunch and dinner. Um, and it, culture will gobble up any change initiative that you're trying for or that you're currently going through. So struggle up the hill, do your best, inspect and adapt, put a big impediment backlog on your VP's door so that issues can be handled immediately. And um, best of luck. So that's all I have. Thank you guys very much.